Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And guess what? It's Thursday morning at 9 a.m. We have Mike DeWord, our chief scientist. We're going to talk today about the role of immunity response in COVID. Very important we understand this. We all have to understand what's going on. That's the thing about living in the 21st century. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Jay. Good to talk to you. Thank well, you, you, looked, you looked up a little bit about immunity response, and um, you're going to tell us about it. Uh, go for it. Yeah, I ran some basic, uh, I developed some basic simulations, uh, very oversimplified, not really COVID-19 predictive, but just to illustrate some of the principles of the different scenarios for how immune response might go. Um, so in the first slide, I'm gonna kind of lay out the basics of what uh, the ideal is um, for herd immunity. Um, so if you go to the next slide, uh, so in this slide, what you're going to see, what you're seeing is uh, the black area is uh, pixels that there's their cells or people that are not immune or still vulnerable. The green area is people that have gotten sick and become immune. And uh, the yellow are the people that have died. Um, this simulation is really simple, simple rules. You got um, about a 30% chance that if a cell touches a cell that's infected, it becomes infected too. So if you touch a whole bunch of cells that are infected, you have a very high chance of becoming infected. Mm -hmm. um, what you see at the end of the simulation here is about 88% of the people have been infected in this, it, cells have been infected in the simulation. Um, about 2% of them have died because that's the parameter I set, you know, 2% death rate. Um, what's interesting is the large number of voids where there's people that have not been exposed to the virus or cells that have not been exposed to the pathogen aren't immune, but they aren't sick either. They've been protected by herd immunity. So this community being isolated, not having any external inputs of virus, has achieved herd immunity. Um, does that, does, but does that mean that they, they were never exposed to it? Uh, right. Or that they right. have some the process cell going on? To the, right, just sheer random luck in this case. So, so, so it's not that the cells that are in the larger black regions have had any special property that protected them. They just got lucky. That, that group of cells was not infected, uh, but the infection went around them, so it created a barrier around them so that no virus could come in from the outside from the rest of the community. And so they, they lucked out. Um, they're still vulnerable, but they're not gonna, they're not sick. They're not gonna get sick as, as long as this community stays isolated. Um, so on the next slide, I show a what if, um, what if, what if you could slow it down? What if you could actually, so in the, the first slide, every cell had a 30% chance of being infected if it touched an infected cell. In this slide, I've dumped that down to 25%, a much lower, a lower chance of being infected. And under these conditions, um, the, uh, the disease doesn't reach the entire community. It, it fizzles out. So it still reaches like half the, more than half the community, but it's fizzled out before it reached the entire community. So masking, um, you know, social distancing, hand washing, all those things, uh, just shows how, what the effect might be. It'll limit the spread of the virus in your community and save a bunch of infected possibilities. And what you're saying is this is the end of it. That with, with this process, what you just described, it never goes further. Not unless you have some external inputs. And so on the next slide, we'll show what happens if you have external inputs. This slide's the same um, as before, except now um, every, once, every 10 weeks or so, an, an external source comes in and provides another seed. And so you can see more than one green area growing. And so instead of being self-limiting, this is continually being reseeded with new infection. And it's gonna go on for a while, because um, what's gonna happen is that the voids, you'll see black voids where there's no infection yet, uh, where people have not been infected. So the infected people that die or become immune, immunity is permanent in this simulation. And um, as you bring in people from outside who are infected occasionally, you'll start to see those voids fill in, which means that nobody is really, really safe if you have these external sources of infection. And this is what they tried in Sweden. They tried kind of isolating the old age homes and trying to get the infection to go around them. But then they had these random incidents where somebody would get in every once in a while and a lot of old people died in the nursing homes. Um, so it's just, it's a really hard game to play. And we can let this go on a while because you'll see that all these black areas start to fill in, but that's the basic principle. The blue curve at the lower left 
Um, the big initial first big spike is what you would get if you, from the initial infection, there's a huge spike and then it dies down very long times without any new clusters. Then there's sporadic clusters of new infections showing up. And that's what the herd immunity has provided you with a way to control your spikes of infection after your initial big, big spike. But then you still have these sporadic reinfections from outside that you can actually predict you know, what their size is going to be. You don't know exactly where they're gonna happen, but you, you know about how big those clusters are gonna be and you can plan for them. And, and they stay on the low side, right? Am I right? Yeah, the They're side. not going to jump up the way the original, the original chart jumped up. Right, right. They won't jump up the original chart because most of the people in most of the cells in this pandemic simulation have acquired immunity, permanent immunity from having been sickened by the virus or they're dead. So in this case, it's about one and a half percent end up dead, but it's, it keeps going. It keeps going as the, as the voids fill in, more cells will die and more cells will become immune. Um, and so now this doesn't account for the fact that some uh, cells might have a higher susceptibility to death. Some cells might be low. This is a really simple simulation to illustrate general principles. Of how yeah, but so, so far, Mike, it would appear that this one is closer to the reality. No? Yeah, it's closer to the reality. Um, uh, so yeah, so the point is that you're, you can try to protect certain communities in certain subsets and you might get lucky and not be initially infected, um, they will then subsequently be still at risk from external sources. You know, somebody going to the mainland and bringing the virus back, or um, some tourists coming in, something. You know, there's a random reseedings. And that's the way societies suffered before there were vaccines. Um, you would have Hawaii be, you know, have a wave of infection and then it would die down. Then there'd be somebody else coming in with a disease, another wave of infection, and it would just continue like that and then eventually affecting the whole community. So now the fourth slide shows what happens if the immunity isn't permanent. So here in the case, the immunity wanes after about 20 weeks. So you see the green cells turning, the, turning green as they get infected, blue is contagious, yellow is dead, black is susceptible, green is immune. The immunity doesn't last. So this thing just keeps going on and on and on, spreading around the community. And there's some external you know, seedings going on here as well, just as in the previous simulation. But it, you, you end up with um, you know, five to 20% immune, depending on where you are in the cycle. And it just goes in waves. Uh, I mean, the blue curve at the lower left shows how the new case is a is, is huge spike, just like you know, first couple of years of the normal infection where everybody gets permanently immune. Then it dies down. And there's another after a couple of years, there's another huge spike. Then it dies down, and it's sort of unpredictable. Well, it's predictable in a general sense, but these spikes don't get smaller in area. They they may get low. They may not at the same height, but they'll have fatter widths, or and so you'll end up in reinfecting about the same number of people. Um, everybody's going to be susceptible except for the people who've died, who of course aren't susceptible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, this reminds so, me uh, like, uh, of of um, this uh, series I've been watching on Amazon uh, about the Black Death, the Black Plague yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the 6th century, um, in the 14th century, and to some extent in the 19th century here in Hawaii. Yeah. Um, and it, it follows the same kind of pattern. Of course, they didn't have any medicine for it. Um, it follows yeah. the same yeah. kind of pattern where, it, you know, you do develop a kind of herd immunity, um, but it comes back. Right. Uh, every you know five or ten years, another outburst here or outburst there, and it yeah. keeps going. Like for centuries, it keeps going. Um, yeah. And I guess the you know that that is uh, that is troubling, in the sense yeah. that we don't know if we can achieve right. uh, immunity by way of a vaccine that will last right. indefinitely. Right. So we can have vaccine or no, we could have this kind of repetition going forward. Now. Yeah, that, that's the problem with the. Bubonic plague was a bacterium for which we don't have vaccines. Uh, very few bacteria can actually vaccinate against. So you don't acquire permanent immunity after infection with your Cinea pestis, you know, the plague bacterium. And so you can have this reseeding, you're all susceptible again. You can get plagued more than once. And every time the reaper gets a bite at you, you know, you, you could die. And that's it. If your immunity doesn't last, and we're hoping that the T cells may provide that memory, the memory T cells may provide memory to make lasting immunity. 
but if the antibody response is indication, the immunity to the coronavirus may not last and you'll end up being susceptible for a long time and having to continually protect the community, either through vaccines. If there's a vaccine that lasts more than six months, that's great. If it lasts forever, that's the, that's, that's the ideal. We don't know yet how long the vaccine immunity will, will last. Well, when it stops lasting, um, uh, it, it's probably graduated, right? It, it doesn't stop on, on a certain day and then you don't have it, you know, so that perhaps the immunity is, is going to decline and, and therefore you still have some limited resistance to right. the disease uh, right. as it declines. Um, right. But I guess right. if you had no vaccine and if you had no antibodies, no immunity, whatever, um, a, you could, you could get it again. And B, this is my question, is when it gets a second time, is it the same or is it worse? Well, my understanding from what I've read is that it can be worse because you've already gotten some damage to your lungs and possibly to your heart. So your body has been weakened by the first bout with this coronavirus, statistically speaking. You know, some people may completely recover with no lasting effects and be just as strong but some people will have lasting damage and then the second time around, the infection is more likely to kill them. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, that, that's the thing about this disease. You, you don't want to go through multiple bouts. You don't want to go through one bout at all if you can avoid it. So we might end up having to have a vaccine where every year you have to get revaccinated. It'd be like, like the seasonal flu, you know, every year like a seasonal coronavirus vaccine. Um, you know, uh, what, what, what is, what's a little troubling, if you make the comparison to the, the pestis uh, bacteria back in the, in the plague, I mean, we don't have plague anymore because we have anti uh, antibiotics, you know. That's right, the antibiotics kill the plague. Yeah. But um, in, the, in the day, uh, it created an opportunistic opportunity for other antigens and other diseases. So you would have um, mm -hmm. a raging mm -hmm. plague, and, and then as people weakened, uh, then you'd have another disease come on top of that. So you had a, a cocktail of antigens working on you. Uh, it was hard to survive that. Yeah, it's got a seasonal flu that might weaken you. And then the coronavirus comes along, and takes advantage of your weakened state to infect you. And it's coronavirus more, far more likely to kill you. This yeah. SARS COVID-19 virus. Yeah. Um, and there's a hypothesis that some other coronaviruses that cause common colds might provide cross immunity but their cross immunity is probably gonna be no more long lasting than to this COVID-19 itself. So you can't really rely on giving everybody the common cold to protect you. Um, even if that hypothesis proves out that the common cold can provide some common kind of cross immunity. Um, yeah. so there's so many unknowns yet you know, that need to be really tested thoroughly. Well, that's, that's the thing that really bothers me. If I can take a, a short digression here. Unknowns, this is the 21st century. Sure. We can, we've been to the moon. We yes. have solved the most incredible problems. Yeah. We have, we have uh, come out on information technology you wouldn't believe. Yeah. And yet these fundamental things affecting life and death of the species, we don't know. We don't know how it well, works. We spent and the money more, on videos and- have uh, been around, these things have been around forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like viruses, um, uh, yeah. live within us uh, for the last uh, two, three hundred thousand years in the development of the species. Um, and they're going to be with us for a long time. And mm -hmm. it's almost like we, we really can't do anything about it ultimately. Well, no, we wiped out smallpox. And we're okay. on the verge of wiping out polio if we can get the Taliban to let the vaccinators into Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, so we're on the verge of wiping out certain viral diseases, and we just about wiped out guinea worm, which isn't a virus, but it's a disease that caused a lot of misery in the world through, as long as there's been humans around almost. So we have successfully wiped out a bunch of diseases. Uh, what we're seeing, though, now is you know, people saying, oh, well, I don't want to get vaccinated. I don't trust the vaccines. Well, the vaccine will save your life. Polio. Do you know anybody who's caught polio lately? I mean, no. And, and yet, when I was a kid, you know, the vaccine came out right before I was born. My parents must have been living in terror until I could actually get that vaccine. And now I don't have to worry about polio. Um, don't have to worry about smallpox. And I had to get my flu vaccine every year. I don't have to worry about the flu so much. Uh, the vaccine isn't perfect. Um, there's, 
but, but the thing mm-hmm. is that, okay, this virus, which we haven't seen much of, yeah. is now right. flowering. And right. hopefully we can beat it or subdue it. But I'll tell yeah. you now, I, I'm 100% guarantee that when this one's done, there'll be another one. There will be another one. Yeah. And so what we, what we have to do is invest more in the predictions of where the viruses are going to be, the research, because coronaviruses, they were just dismissed as, oh, that's just the common cold. We're not going to worry about them. And this one comes along. So now there's research funding, but we were ignoring it for a long time. We were putting money into the Wall Street casino instead of into our public health. Um, <laughs> and we really need, you know, governments to step up and allocate resources appropriately for the common good. Um, we need governments to actually be sponsors of clinical trials for medicines so we don't have to rely on companies to do it. Because companies only do it as a big profit motive, um, which is understandable. But you know, for a vaccine, you want it to be cheap, widely available, so you can give doses to everyone without anybody not being able to afford it. Because if anyone is at risk, everyone's at risk with this disease. So. So what we need is a new paradigm for how we conduct medical research because we, our scientists can do it. I mean, there's brilliant people in the United States, Europe, China, India. We can solve these problems, but we have to make it a priority for our societies to solve these problems and really put the right funding behind it. And better public education. People really need to be getting vaccinated. There's no excuse for a measles outbreak in the United States of America in the 21st century. No excuse. I mean, yeah, measles should, should have been a thing of the past in the, in, in the first world because we know we can vaccinate against it and save lives. Well, you're being kind to say that it's a question of public education. I, I rather think you make, a, you make a law. And I think ultimately there'll have right. to be laws like this. You say, if you want to take a chance on this, you can't do it in public. You have to do it in jail. Uh, and then we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. So yeah, but that, I say that, so. It's a matter of public education, because we live in a democracy, and the voters have to vote in the politicians who will make the laws. And so, if the politicians won't make the laws, or they vote in politicians who are hostile to making laws promoting public health, then we still have a problem. And it's still a problem of education. We got to educate the voters that you know this. This is science. This is real and we need to protect ourselves as a nation as a world from these threats i mean if it was space aliens coming down with ray guns yeah we'd be mobilizing the military and developing new weapons but this is an invisible pathogen that you know is and it still wants to kill us just like the space aliens with ray guns would want to do i mean i mean it doesn't have conscious intention but it's you know it's still going to go after us mm-hmm. so yeah. So maybe, you know, what we find out about immunity and how the body has natural defenses and processes to deal with its antigens that it has not met, uh, yeah. or maybe it's met in another form. Yeah. <clears throat> maybe we'll learn something here in this thing, experience with COVID that we can apply against the, the next pandemic and yes. you know, some other antigen. Yes. Um, are, are we doing that or, or is the focus on just dealing with COVID, which would be very narrow-minded, I think, in, in these times. Well, they are coming up with whole new approaches to creating vaccines, so that, approaches that don't rely on just looking at the surface proteins of the virus, but look at targeting the entire virus, so it's inside the virus capsule as well. Uh, so there's whole new approaches to this uh, developing, uh, which would then have applications to other diseases in the future. The more tools in our arsenal, for developing vaccines, the better. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. but you say it's a global, it's a global experience, and uh, you have to, you have to save, you have to save everybody to save anybody. Um, yeah. And uh, it's like we were talking in another show yesterday about um, about global economics. Um, mm-hmm. The way to get to um, improve the, the global economy is is trade. It's exchanging goods and services mm-hmm. among nations. And, and yeah. putting the borders down, not bringing them up. Uh, and that's, that's the way to have a global economy that, that befits everyone. Sounds to me like, like science must um, put the barriers down. Science must, you name the number of countries that are working on this. But there are barriers to that, especially right now in this administration. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you're going to make the Chinese close their 
their consulate in Houston uh, and otherwise put barriers between us and the Chinese that, that does stand in the way of joint research, which could be very valuable. Um, yeah. So I, to me, it's like trades. You have to collaborate on, the, on an international basis in order to achieve a, a, a meaningful vaccine. Yeah, it's like we shut down the uh, research group that was actually looking at bats in China and trying to understand how these viruses evolved in bats because there were Chinese researchers involved. Um, wrong way to go, in my opinion. We should be doing everything we can as a species to save our, ourselves from these viruses, to understand these viruses, um, to make sure, every, because if everybody in the world isn't safe, like the simulation showed, if you think you have herd immunity in your group, but there's still people vulnerable, if you're trading, if there's any visitors, if there's any external source anywhere, it could be you had to go visit your sick auntie in Kansas, and now you come back and you spread the virus. Um, nobody's safe. Nobody's safe if everybody isn't safe. And, and to think that we can be isolated from each other um, is not realistic. I mean, even in the age of sail, sailing ships, it wasn't realistic. It took maybe longer but just meant that it was more time for immunity to wane between exposures. So. Tell me if this is relevant, Mike. You know, in my earlier days, I was fascinated with the notion of, of bacterial colonies. And uh, what I understood from people who studied more science than I did is that a bacterial colony has a life cycle. It starts mm -hmm. out uh, knitting itself together. You can hardly see it, but it's getting stronger under yeah. the hood. And then one day it sort of pops up, goes into the logarithmic phase, and, uh, you know, huge growth in the back number of bacteria. And then it yeah. hits a plateau and it, it fiddles around in the plateau for a while. And one day it drops down the other side into the death phase. And, and what I understood was every bacterial colony goes through that process. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's physics. It's a rule of the, the natural world around us. And there's only one exception to the death phase. And that's when you introduce bacteria from another colony. And that reinvigorates the bacteria in the first colony. And there seems to me a parallel here. I mean, you know, take a virus that's, that's scour a scourge around the world. It, it ultimately will, I, I don't want to use Trump's word disappear, but it ultimately will you know, expire. <clears throat> and, the, and the way that you, in a given location and the way that it can reinvigorate itself is with the introduction of other viruses, other antigens that that reinvigorated. Am I right? Is, is there a reasonable parallel here? Uh, well, like, like like one simulation showed, you, even if you don't have a different virus, if herd immunity wanes, you can go through long periods where you don't have that much virus in your community and then it ramps up. And it's in the simulation, it's the same virus, same peep, same cells that could be infected, same uh, citizens, if you will. But um, it just goes through these waves and cycles. So you think you beat it and now it's back. Um, now with this virus, it will evolve and it will evolve faster than humans will. It you takes us mutate. many generations. To, you mean mutate. Right, it will it'll, it'll mutate. It, and most mutations might make it less virulent, but there will some that might make it more virulent. We don't know yet how that will go. Um, we know that if it kills 90% of its victims, it will be self-limiting. If it kills 2%, there's no reason for it to be self-limiting. Uh, what if it starts killing 3%? What if it just starts being more contagious? Um, what if it becomes as contagious as a measles? So right now, coronavirus, on average, if you leave it alone, two or three people get infected by every person who has the disease. For the measles, it's seven. It's about seven people become measles is so contagious if a person with the measles has the disease leaves the room and you walk in 15 minutes later you can catch it just from doesn't, the, that, doesn't that happen with coronavirus too um that's not clear if it's that if you can do it that way if it's that long or if the droplets have to be a little larger there's some evidence that masks are effective because they block the larger virus droplets and limit the dose of virus you're inhaling and it seems that in this case dose may make the poison that a high dose infecting you overwhelms your body's defenses quicker than they can mobilize. A low dose infecting you, and you might get a mild case. That was just in the research news in the last couple of days. So um, measles seems to be, doesn't take much at all to infect you. It looks like coronavirus takes a little bit more, um, but what if it becomes as dangerous as, as 
infective as measles, mm. uh, then then we've got a, a whole nother problem. Um, and but but the, that, the, the deliver, delivery system is still in the in the droplets or the aerosol that is by by air by breathing. Mm -hmm. And That's so what it looks like yeah. What I was going to say is it's okay to buy more masks than you, you think you need. It's a good investment for the future, even if we come up with uh, therapeutics that are impressive uh, yeah. and vaccines that last at least for a, a little while. I think our, our species is going to need masks for a longer while, don't you? Yeah, because it's going to be years before we can distribute a vaccine to everybody in the world. Um, even if the vaccine was available next week, you know, they, they proved it works, safe, et cetera. Um, it'll be years before they can get it to everybody in the world. And so we're going to be dealing with this for years. Um, and, so yeah. if I asked you on a, on a given, given what we know about the, the immunity system, given the research, given the focus on research, you know, we haven't, fo as you said, we haven't focused on it. Maybe we should have been focusing more on it. We've been focusing on other areas of science and technology, but not this one. Um, but but all of that considered, are, are you, would you say that in, on behalf of the the species that we should be optimistic, very optimistic, not so optimistic? On behalf of species, we should be optimistic. I mean, <laughs> on, on behalf of any particular individual, that's another matter. But you know, the species, we'll solve these problems. I mean, if the United States closes its borders and says we're not going to accept any vaccines from other people, the Brits will do it or the Europeans will do it, or the Chinese will do it, or the Indians will do it. Somebody is gonna crack this problem and the species will be fine in the long run. I mean, yes, we might be dealing with this virus for years, but it's not gonna wipe us out. We're gonna, I mean, well, even plague didn't wipe us out. I mean, so plague wipes out half the people in Europe in the 13th, 14th century, and then the Europeans go on to take over the world anyway. Uh, yeah, just because everybody else is, he, you know, not not conquering things. So, um, given that, so I'm uh, I'm so just the speed. Pardon me. Given that, I'm I'm reminded of these baskets of stock you can buy, or you used to be able to buy on the stock exchange, where you say, I, I, "You're interested in energy? Okay, here's a basket of stocks of energy, <clears throat> and uh, you know whether this company makes it or that company makes it." If you believe that energy is the big thing, buy the basket. Right. <clears throat> it seems to me that we don't really know yet what company is going to come up with um, right. you know, a, a, a vaccine. It's not clear. And, and one company was quoted yesterday to say when the government asked them, are they going to give this away? They said, no, no. We're looking for profit. Right. Right? We want to get a return on our capital. We put a lot of money in, um, right. you know, in addition to what the government put in. And yeah. so um, you say to yourself, well, I, but I don't know which one. So maybe there's a basket, a basket right. of COVID stocks, everybody working on it. Put all those stocks in one basket, invest in the basket. That wouldn't be a bad idea. Well, I'm, I'm almost certain there's an ETF for COVID-19 research and development and vaccines. So you got to find an exchange traded fund that requires huge fees. The, uh, you know, probably a couple, you could buy your own, you could do your own research and buy individual stocks if you want. Um, but you, yeah, it's very hard to predict who the winner is going to be. So you want to put your eggs in, you know, in a, you have more than one egg in that basket. Uh, you might buy Pfizer, you might buy AstraZeneca, you might buy, you know, I, I don't know the names of the ones in India, or if, the, if even the Chinese ones are even on the stock exchange. So. Yeah, you can buy a healthcare. I know you can buy a healthcare ETF. You might be able to buy a COVID ETF now. So, <laughs> uh, well. I and mean, if I were in that business, it would be really smart for me to put together such an ETF and be offering it for sale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very interesting. It, it 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 demonstrates your your essential optimism, Mike. <laughs> right, right, right. No, I yeah, the species will survive. The yeah. individuals will die. There may be even countries that go into decline because they were ignoring this thing. You know, it strikes me that if you if you if you move the frame back for a month or two months, we knew there was COVID, and we we talked in, you know incessantly about vaccines and to a lesser degree therapeutics. Yeah. Um, 
you know, but we didn't know any of the details. We didn't know who was working on it. We didn't know the mechanisms. We didn't know about the T cell thing you mentioned before. We didn't know about the inter interaction with the, um, you know, the immune system. Um, but now we hear about it and now we can drill down. Now there are articles, not only in scientific journals, but in the mainstream media about what companies are working on what and what their time frames are. I don't know if I believe what the government says about this, but I mean, I, you take a, a lot of these articles and after a while it gives you an idea about what's happening out there in yeah. science. Yeah. And so that means, Mike, that we have to continue following this because my, my guess is there'll be more coming out about it every day. Right. Well, we're going to hit, uh, you know, another million people in the United States sick with it, have been sick with this thing in two weeks. Two weeks after that, another million people. And we're on track to hit six million people by the first week of September in the United States alone. And it's out of control. So, yes, we're going to be dealing with it for a while. Um, and it, will, it does worry me that people might be scared away from the election in November because they don't want to risk being in a crowd and getting the virus. We'll have to deal with that as a democracy, as a society, figure out how to work around that. Because um, we really, really need a vibrant, healthy democracy. Uh, and we can't let this stupid virus be the thing that you know, takes it away from us. So. Yeah, the way things set up, it's, it's not only we need the democracy because it's a, it's a, a better, more humane way to, to govern ourselves. Right. But, but uh, it's clear to me that we need a democracy because that helps us make better decisions about yeah. public health. Yes. And it's th therefore becomes life and death. That's yeah, why for the moment, we really need a democracy. <laughs> yeah, it is life and death. You know, the Chinese were not democ the real democracy. They, they have elections, but they're you know, only the party, one party allowed. And they were in denial for a long time. They denied the severity. They weren't listening to the people. They weren't allowing healthy debate. They finally couldn't ignore it anymore. But it took them a while, and then the thing got out of control. And you see that happening in all kinds of countries in the world where the leadership doesn't want to have healthy debate. You, know, you see it in Brazil. Saw it in Russia. Now the Russians have this disease, like the fourth you know, largest nation, in the fourth most cases in the world. Um, and they're by no means got the population to have that level of caseload. I mean, they're like half the U.S. population, if that. Um, so we're, um, we, we see where democracies have healthy debate, like you know, European Union, they've done an amazing job they have. Um, with uh, controlling this thing and coming to a consensus on how to control this thing. Um, European Union may be the safest place to live right now. Uh, well, people have to say that, I re except for Hawaii. We're very good in Hawaii because we got an ocean protecting us. We got a governor that's listened to enough science to say, look, quarantine the visitors until we have a vaccine. Yeah. And then everybody needs to wear a mask. Right now you have to wear a mask if you want to go to the gym, which makes perfect sense. You're breathing heavy, you're sweaty, you know, there's not much circulation in most gyms, you know. Um, so you've got to actually take those extra precautions. So we're, we have a government here that listens, governor here that listens to enough science that we are pretty safe in Hawaii. Um, we'll see what happens when the tourists come back in full force. Yeah, and we have a, we have a vantage point where we can look out to uh, places perhaps less fortunate than we are about how this is going. Um, mm -hmm. And we can see, we can read those scientific journals, we can, we can read the mainstream media, <laughs> we can get a handle on the numbers from here. And I think, you know, to me, the big challenge is uh, that people here should not be complacent. We could be suffering yeah. too, Maybe we will. We have to know. We have to be aware. We have to right. raise the level of awareness. So that's why you and I have to meet from time to time here every couple of weeks sure. and check in on what's going on because I can tell you one thing. It's going to change. It is going to change. Yeah. I'm optimistic, um, although I realize that I could die. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, stay healthy, I'm optimistic Mike. for the species. So. Stay healthy. Yeah. Take care. Mike Thank DeWert, our chief scientist. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you, Joey. Aloha. Aloha.